So I'm really honored that I get to guest lecture for you guys today, and I'm very excited to share with you some of the research that I've been doing in the last couple of years that's looking at the gut-brain axis in aging and neurodegeneration, and then the role that exercise has on restoring gut and brain health. For those of you who don't know, I'm Kaylee Zaponta. I'm currently a PhD student in exercise physiology and neurology in the biokinesiology and physical therapy department at the University of Southern California. And if you have any questions about this content that we're going to go over today that you want to discuss with me further, I'm happy, happy to talk research with you. Uh, my contact information is below. So we know that aging is accompanied with a decline in many physiologic systems, right? We see a loss in bone or an increased prevalence of osteoporosis. We see a loss in muscle or an increased risk of sarcopenia. And then as we age, we will most likely develop metabolic dysregulations. But some of the most common disparities that we see as we age are neurodegenerative in nature. So we have um, an increased risk of developing cortical-like neurodegenerative disorders, which would be things like myocognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. And they call it cortical because it's affecting the cortical region. And then conversely, we might see neurodegenerative disorders that are subcortical in nature, so they're affecting the subcortical region. And these would include things like vascular dementia, Huntington, Huntington's disease, or Parkinson's disease. And just briefly, the brain regions that are affected with each of these different subcategories of neurodegeneration are as follows. So with, if someone's experiencing a cortical neurodegenerative disorder, they're likely going to have some sort of damage or degeneration to their prefrontal cortex or their supplementary motor area. And these would cause deficits in motor and executive function or attention, and then also planning of complex movements. And so when what we see in these neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's is a storage issue, right? There's a specific deficit in their ability to recall information because they can't store new information that is being presented to them. And then they have um, a poor ability to recognize information that's already been or memories that have already been presented to them pre-disease. And subcortically, if someone is experiencing one of these diseases, then the areas that are going to be affected are more like the basal ganglia, uh, the cerebellum, or even the brainstem. And all of these systems control motor function, they control posture and balance. And then the brainstem in particular is this sort of relay center that sends information to and from the spinal cord and peripheral uh, nervous system. And so if somebody experiences one of these diseases or is suffering from one of these diseases, then they're going to develop processing issues. So they have a reduced executive functioning, they have better recognition than someone with a cortical neurodegenerative disorder, but they have a, um, it, it's only when they are presented in the context of, you know, certain things, right? So if they have cues or retrieval mechanisms, then they can recognize things better. But these types of neurodegenerative disorders are often accompanied with slower motor function or motor impairments. So from the vantage point of the brain, these impairments are actually due to neural inflammation, a loss of neuroplasticity, increased activity in some of these brain regions that are involved in some of these movements and processing and things like that, which causes a compensation in the recruitment of other brain regions. And this compensation can lead to things like impediments. So there's a lot of different theories out there as to what these impediments are. Um, two of the most common are crosstalk impediments and the bottleneck theory, which essentially means that there is this crosstalk, right? There's these, um, you know, two regions of the brain are trying to communicate with each other or they're trying to kind of, you know, do their thing and function as they should. And there's this crosstalking effect that causes it so that the person is manifesting as cognitive or motor impairments. And a bottlenecking theory essentially just means that there's too much information for the brain to kind of tease out, parse out what's actually happening and what they need to prioritize or what the brain needs to prioritize in order to induce movement or cognition. So neurodegenerative diseases all include some form of motor or cognitive dysfunction. And these include things like um, cognitive impairments like increased cortical activity, impaired speech, impaired recall or recognition. And then on the motor side of things, we see things like postural instability, slower gait speed, or more gait variability. And so if we think about subcortical diseases like Parkinson's, these symptoms make sense. If you've ever seen someone with Parkinson's disease, then you're probably familiar with some of these um, kind of manifestations of motor impairments. So maybe that person who has Parkinson's disease might be leaning forward and they might not be able to hold themselves upright. They might be walking slower or they might kind of shuffle their feet when they walk. Fortunately, exercise in the last two decades or so 
has been shown to be really, really good for neurodegenerative diseases. It's shown to have really important cognitive function benefits um, and increase, it increases gait and physical function, and then it can even improve mood and anxiety. Neurologically, the rationale behind why exercise is so beneficial is because exercise involves skill acquisition and it can regulate essentially neural inflammation. So as a result, what we see is that these cognitive er, impairments start to improve because we have an increase in neuroplasticity from acquiring new skills. And because we have regulated neural inflammation, we see motor improvements like regulated stride length and increased gait speed. But skill acquisition plateaus soon after participating or beginning an exercise program, right? If you think about you are implementing a, a resistance exercise program to someone who is an older adult or who has neurodegenerative disorders, chances are they probably haven't squatted or done a leg press before. And if they have, then they might not have as much experience with it. But in any case, after one or two weeks of doing the same squats or the same leg presses, the person is going to have acquired that skill and that skill acquisition is gonna plateau, right? So there has to be something else going on that can explain some of these exercise benefits. And we know as exercise physiologists that there are, right? We have these peripheral systems that interact with the brain that are physiologically improved with exercise. And because they interact with the brain, the question is, is that part of the reason why these people with neurodegenerative diseases are experiencing such good benefits after they have plateaued with that skill acquisition? So in fact, peripheral physiologic systems are actually associated with cognitive and motor function. So we've seen that sarcopenia is associated with cognitive decline. We've seen that neuroinflammation occurs due not just because of what's happening in the brain, but because of many physiologic systemic impairments. And then we've actually seen that there's a relationship between motor functioning and cognition, mostly in depression and anxiety literature. So these links or associations substantiate the need to look peripherally at other systems that actually influence the brain. One such physiologic system that I'm really interested in is the gut microbiota. And in fact, there's shown to be a connection between the gut microbiota and the brain. And it makes sense if you think about it, right? So we have our nervous system, we have our central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spinal cord. We have our peripheral nervous system, which basically includes everything else. And within the peripheral nervous system is something called the autonomic nervous system. This is the nervous system that works automatically. It governs things like our heart and our lungs and also our gastrointestinal tract. On the gastrointestinal tract, and this is a, a sagittal view of the intestines, resides this autonomic nervous system component or subsect called the enteric nervous system. So we have the sagittal view of the intestines. You can see the microvilli here, and there's three different layers. And within these layers exist neurons and glial cells that communicate with other parts of the nervous system. This communication system is known as the gut-brain axis. It's this bi-directional communication system between the central nervous system or the brain and the enteric nervous system, which I said is a part of the autonomic nervous system or the ANS. And these myoenteric nerves connect to the vagus nerve and communicate with the brain to do the following. They regulate inflammatory markers, they regulate neurotransmitter signaling and synthesis, and they regulate and govern met metabolism by producing metabolic byproducts. It's really interesting because I think that in the last couple of years or probably the last couple of decades, a leaky gut or dysregulations to the gut microbiota has been linked to a lot of different diseases, right? We've seen it linked to adrenal fatigue, to rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune disorders um, like thyroid like disorders, Hashimoto's and Graves, things like that. But it's also been attributed to the brain and certain disorders that are involved with the brain, things like depression and anxiety and ADHD. I think that some of the associative literature that came out first looked at how dysbiosis is associated with anxiety and depression. There's a lot of different literature out there. These are just two examples and I, uh, they're reviews and meta-analyses because there's so much, but essentially gut dysregulations are associated with an increased prevalence of anxiety and depression-like symptoms. And in neurodegenerative disorders, Gastrointestinal related symptoms have actually been highly prevalent and linked to disease risk. So this fact was one of the first motivating factors that led me to look at neurodegeneration and specifically Parkinson's disease. It's really interesting when you talk to neurologists because I think before probably 10 years ago, 
they would tell you that a lot of their patients who have Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease experience things like constipation or diarrhea or bloating, but they never really attributed it to the actual disease. It was more so just the supplementary symptom that they were experiencing that was presumably unrelated. But in fact, it is really prevalent and it's also very related and almost even predictive of disease prognosis and progression. So we've seen that in an elderly population, constipation is highly prevalent and in neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease, um, it actually constipation, if you have it for more than 10 years prior to disease onset, it increases your risk of developing Parkinson's disease twofold. So you can see here, this is a meta-analysis that looked at four different longitudinal studies. Um, and they essentially just followed people for about 20 years to kind of track their constipation habits. And um, then if somebody developed Parkinson's disease, they were put into the Parkinson's disease group. And if they didn't, obviously they're put into the controls. And what they found is that if someone had constipation for 10 years or more prior to the diagnosis, that it increased the risk of developing Parkinson's disease the risk ratios and odd ratios were anywhere between 2.01 and 2.7. So it's clear that the gut plays an important role in brain function, but I wanna kind of take a step back for a second and talk about the gut and overview of the gut a little bit. So just to kind of put in perspective how important the gut is, there's actually 10 times the number of gut bacteria than we have cells in our body. So they're very important, there's a lot of them and they play huge roles because they interact with corresponding hosts. So things like your liver or your muscle or even your brain. And what they do is they regulate things like immunity and inflammation, metabolism, and then also neuroendocrine responses. And this was another factor that kind of led me down the neurodegenerative research rabbit hole as it were. I didn't realize this, but about 50% of dopamine and about 90% of serotonin are actually produced in the gut. So again, this kind of tells us that we think of these neurotransmitters as brain, you know, being located in the brain, but the fact that they're actually produced in the gut and a large proportion of them are uh, produced in the gut, it kind of indicates that there's a communication and that the gut plays a large role in brain function. So in order for us to measure how healthy a gut is, we can't just look at the bacterial concentrations because there's a lot of different interactions and it's very complex. So instead we have to look at these four different kind of markers to indicate whether or not a gut is healthy. The first thing we look at is its abundance. So this is probably the most straightforward measure of, you know, indicating whether a gut is healthy or not. We're essentially just looking at the sufficient concentrations of each bacteria. So I have just an example from a study here that looked at dementia um, versus non-dementia populations. And each of the colors here represents relative changes in each of these bacterial strains. The bacterial strains don't necessarily matter, but just for the sake of argument and explanation, what you can see here is that if someone has dementia, they have proportionately less, excuse me, relatively less bacterioids than if somebody does not have dementia. But what we also wanna look at is the diversity of the gut. So the best way that I can explain gut diversity would be kind of looking at it from a social context, right? We know diversity as it pertains to social norms is essentially making sure that there are appropriate representations of each different ethnic group or each different religion or sexual orientation, et cetera. And the more diverse the population is, the better off we will be, right? Because we have, you know, people from different ethnicities that are contributing really positive things to the culture. In the same way, bacterial diversity is really important, right? The more of these bacterial strains that we have present in our gut, the more they can do their thing. They can function in each of these different very vital and important things that they need to do. So this is a very, very simplified example of what diversity looks like, but essentially this person only has four bacterial species present um, or representative in their gut versus this person has eight or double the amount of bacterial strains that are present. So the person with more diversity is probably going to have their gut function much more effectively. Thirdly, we want to see that there are sufficient metabolites. So there's a lot of different types of metabolites, but essentially what they are is this byproduct of food interacting with bacteria. So an example here are some of the most abundant metabolites in our guts, which are known as short chain fatty acids. And these would be things like propionate, acetate, and butyrate. And then what we also want to make sure of is that we have regulated inflammation, right? Too much is bad, too little is bad, but we want just enough of a stimulus so that we can regulate the immune system. But if we have too much inflammation, we know that this is what is called typically um, in 
culture today, not in science, but in culture, a leaky gut. So we see that there's damage to the intestinal lining. This damage scientifically is known as dysbiosis. So this is a picture here of what the intestines look like in a normal setting or a healthy setting. We have the epithelial cells of the intestines and they're bound together by these tight gap junctions. So it's kind of like the blood brain barrier in our brain, right? It prevents bad stuff from getting into the gut and it prevents bacteria and metabolites from leaking out into the circulating, um, into our circulation. But when we have excessive inflammation, these inflammatory markers are upregulated and they essentially leak into the bloodstream because the epithelial lining here is damaged and there's an increase in permeability. What this causes is a reconstitution of bacteria and metabolites. So we have pathogens that start to invade the gut. We have inflammatory markers and metabolites that start to get into the bloodstream and it can breach the blood brain barrier. It can cause inflammation, autoimmunity and malabsorption or nutrient deficiencies. We've seen that dysbiosis is present in cortical dementias like Alzheimer's disease. So I won't get into the pathology of what Alzheimer's disease is, but I just kind of wanted to show you like basic pathology so we can understand how dysbiosis affects it. So essentially what we see in um, an aging population is this influx of uh, inflammatory markers in the bloodstream that will damage, um, that will kind of like leak into the brain because the blood brain barrier is breached. It'll damage neurons um, these inflammatory cells, and then also it will cause amyloid beta plaques to get built up, which will further damage neurons and things like that. And before, traditional ideology is that Alzheimer's disease occurs only in the brain, right? So we have all of this neurodegeneration, this inflammation, it's only occurring in the brain. But this new model that shows that the gut plays a role in the brain function and neurodegenerative side of things is that these endotoxins or these stressors that cause inflammation actually originate in the gut. So we have, you know, a lot of different kind of like lifestyle factors that um, damage the gut. They increase permeability in the gut and epithelial barrier, um, which will send a lot of these inflammatory markers through the gut brain axis to breach the blood brain barrier and to cause or contribute to at least Alzheimer's disease. And dysbiosis has also been seen in subcortical dementias like Huntington's disease. So in both animal and human models, we've seen a reduction in gut diversity in those with Huntington's disease and similar pathologies to Alzheimer's. And the type of subcortical dementia that I'm interested in with my research is Parkinson's disease. So similar to Huntington's and Alzheimer's disease, there's been emerging evidence that has kind of changed the vantage point at how we view Parkinson's disease development. So the traditional pathology of Parkinson's disease is essentially that in the substantia nigra, which again is subcortical, it controls motor function and things like that, that there's an aggregation of this protein called alpha-C-nuclein. So you can see here these red little dots, that's alpha-C-nuclein that's essentially ag or aggregating in the substantia nigra, and it damages dopaminergic neurons in that area or this, yeah. But there's a new proposed mechanism that involves the gut. So rather than, again, this just happening in the brain, because there's this connection between the enteric nervous system and the central nervous system, we know that there's an influence of the enteric nervous system and the gut that um, actually plays a larger role in the development of Parkinson's disease. So Heiko Brock was a uh, pathologist and researcher who was the first person to propose this to be true. Essentially what he is suggesting, rather than it just originating in the brain, is that Parkinson's disease is actually caused by a pathogenic invasion in the gut. This pathogenic invasion leads to damaging of the gut lining here. Um, it also will cause, dysbiosis will cause alpha-C-nuclein to aggregate in the gut rather than the brain. It reduces dopamine synthesis. And then this alpha-C-nuclein is sent to the brain to cause Lewy body formations, which are just a uh, accumulation of these aggregates. It compromises the blood-brain barrier and these two things will contribute to or cause Parkinson's. And we've seen evidence to support Brock's hypothesis um, as early as 1984. What you see here is just histology from um, individuals who had died from Parkinson's disease. It's a sample of their esophagus and you can see the picture's kind of funky because it's really old, but you can see that these black dots are alpha-C nuclein aggregates in the esophagus. 
And then if we fast forward to 2009, in an animal model of Parkinson's disease, what we see is in the mucosa of the intestine, so the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but the red little dots here are phosphorylated alpha-C-nuclein, and then these green guys are the neurofilaments. But we see that alpha-C-nuclein is actually originating in the intestine, so the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus. And then kind of more broadly, in individuals with Parkinson's disease, um, in 2019, Mulock et al. found that gut inflammatory markers like calprotectin are elevated in, um, in the blood in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Since then, about 18 studies, and there might have been more, but this is just what I have to date, 18 studies have shown significant differences in individuals with Parkinson's disease in their bacterial concentrations, in gut inflammatory markers, and in metabolites. And while there's some heterogeneity and it's pretty complex as far as the gut microbiome goes, there have been some consistencies as far as an elevation in some of these inflammatory or bad or damage inducing bacterial markers and a reduction in some of these beneficial commensal bacterial markers. <clears throat> And in fact, gut dysbiosis has actually been shown to play a role in progression and it can even predict PD severity. So we see that some of these hallmark motor symptoms like postural instability and gait speed have actually been associated with dysbiosis. And then this right here is just a staging mechanism, how we can look at the severity of Parkinson's disease. And there have been two studies to date that have shown that dysbiosis actually will predict how severe Parkinson's disease will become in, a, in an individual. So collectively, this evidence kind of provides rationale for us to redirect therapeutic strategies in individuals with PD to specifically restore the gut microbiota. So in my mind, strategies that target the gut microbiota should aim to reduce inflammatory markers and intestinal damage, again, kind of alleviating this leaky gut or dysbiotic state, and it should also increase beneficial bacteria and metabolites. There have been some therapeutic strategies that have been implemented thus far, things like pharmacological strategies such as antibiotics, uh, molecular mimicry, which is essentially where they will augment T cells and then re-implant them into someone's uh, system, and then will help to kind of regulate some of these inflammatory processes that occur in the gut. And then also toll-like receptor modulation, which again, is essentially used to inhibit inflammatory markers, specifically in the gut in this case. But the downside of all of these really is that when we are augmenting things pharmacologically, there's unintended uh, changes that will occur or side effects that will occur as a result, right? So if we think about antibiotics, we can target specific bacteria with antibiotics, but if we don't understand which bacteria to target, then we might be unintentionally eliminating um, uh, beneficial bacteria or even just overall diversity. And then the same goes for molecular mimicry and tolic receptors. There have been other uh, therapeutic strategies, things like fecal transplants that have been done where they essentially take the healthy gut microbiome and um, uh, kind of synthesize it and put it in like a pill form and can give it to someone who has dysbiosis. And this is shown to be effective at reversing dysbiosis in actually numerous animal models with Parkinson's disease and also human models with um, things like bacterial infections like C. diff um, or like irritable bowel disorder. But these are also very risky um, because you're essentially sharing genetic material with another person. There's a lot of adverse side effects and there's actually been a risk of death that has caused for concern. So non-pharmacologically nutrition obviously is probably the first thing that people think about when they think about restoring the gut microbiome. It's the most widely utilized intervention to restore the gut. Um, and interventions have been implemented like increasing uh, unsaturated fats and plant proteins, um, or supplementing with probiotics and high, a high fiber diet. The only thing about nutritional interventions is that these changes are transient, meaning that if you give someone a probiotic supplementation, then after they take it, they're gonna see benefits when they take it, but then after they take it, if they stop, then all of the dysbiotic features will start to come back. Alternatively, exercise has a really unique ability to restore the gut microbiota, and it's actually been shown to restore the gut independent of confounders that we see in the gut and in a more stable and long-lasting manner. We, she, we see that it increases gut diversity, it heals at the intestinal lining that causes dysbiosis, and it reduces these pro-inflammatory markers. So exercise is shown to independently change the gut, um, independent of these common confounders. I should just mention these real quick. 
Um, so age is a common confounder, obesity status and dietary changes are all common confounders of the gut microbiota, but exercise has shown to independently change the gut of these confounders. And I think that exercise was first considered because there were a few studies that have come out in the last 10 years that um, have become really pivotal to kind of provide this physiologic rationale as to why exercise might be helpful. Um, there's been a few studies that have been done that have shown that physical fitness is associated with gut health. Uh, so what you see on the left here is probably one of the first ones that was done. Um, uh, it essentially looked at the difference in gut bacterial indices. So this is just an, an index to look at gut diversity. Um, between people with high BMI, uh, unfit individuals with low BMI, and then fit individuals or athletes. And they found that those with, uh, who are athletes have higher diversity indices than those without. And then this was actually done from San Francisco State with Dr. Bagley and Ryan Dirk looked at the association between VO2 max and gut diversity in healthy college age students and found that the higher someone's VO2 max was, the more diverse their gut would be. On the flip side, resistance exercise has been less seen or muscle mass has been less seen, I should say. Um, but what we do know is that antibiotics actually reduce muscle mass. They're associated with a reduction in muscle mass and that gut diversity is associated with an increase in muscle mass. So there's something there to show us that if we can increase muscle mass, we can improve diversity and gut health overall. In animal models, there's actually been quite a bit done um, to show that exercise has been beneficial on, for the gut. Specifically with aerobic exercise, we see that it can increase bacterial diversity, it can reduce gut inflammation, and it can actually increase GI motility. And this has been seen in animal models that mimic things like type 2 diabetes, cognitive impairment, GI disorders, cancer, and neurodegeneration. And then with resistance exercise, it's really hard to do resistance exercise with animal models. So instead they do something called anaerobic training or exhaustional training. And I included a picture here just to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, most of the time they'll have them like running to exhaustion or running up this kind of like ladder looking thing <laughs> to mimic or to kind of tap into some of those physiologic systems that are, are tapped into would be do resistance exercise. And this type of exercise has been shown to increase metabolite concentrations and actually reduce inflammation. And this has been seen in animal models that mimic anxiety and stress and also obesity. In human models, not much has been done, but there has been some really promising findings. So we see that with aerobic exercise, uh, individuals are able to increase their bacterial diversity. They're actually able to increase metabolite concentrations and they're able to reduce inflammatory gut markers and cancer-like gut markers or necrotic gut markers. And this has been seen in populations with cancer, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. And in resistance exercise, there's actually been only one study to date that has looked at resistance exercise. And it's actually looked at resistance exercise and aerobic with the supplementation of protein. So we kind of have to take this at face value, but essentially what we see is that um, following resistance exercise, there's an increase in anti-inflammatory markers that are produced by the muscle and that muscle or increasing muscle can kind of regulate some of these metabolic hormones that have been associated with gut health. So there's a lot of mechanisms to explain why this occurs. In my mind, I think of two things that could be possible. So first there's an interaction between the gut microbiota and our mitochondria. We know as exercise physiologists that mitochondria is increased by number when we exercise, but also the quality and the function of mitochondria is improved with exercise. Mitochondria also play a really important role in regulating some of these kind of bacterial diversity indices and things like that in the gut. So my thought is if we can increase mitochondria with exercise, that would probably have an influence or an impact on the gut. And then um, I'm gonna highlight another one of my former classmates, Casey Curl and his group um, uh, with Dr. Brooks just came out with a review paper that was looking at lactate and all of the uh, kind of unrecognized benefits of lactate. And one of which is the gut microbiome. So essentially lactate interacts with the gut. It helps to improve metabolism and things like that. And we know that with exercise, lactate is increased. So there's some beneficial um, kind of associations or links that could occur with the gut. So what my research is, is focused on and what my lab is looking at is these exercise-induced improvements that we see in Parkinson's disease that to date have only been recognized as motor benefits, cognitive benefits, and things like that. But are these improvements actually because of the gut microbiome? So it's really exciting research. 
something that I'm really excited to kind of get some data out and share with everybody once I have it. Um, but I think that it's going to kind of change the trajectory of how we view exercise in neurodegeneration and how we view the gut microbiota and how we can kind of modulate that and improve gut health. So with that, I would like to thank you. And if there's any questions, as I said, please feel free to email me or to contact me in any way.